is we have, um, I think before the consent agenda or anything, mm -hmm. I wanna, we have some public here to speak. So I think we're going to call you up and you can give your presentation and then we'll go about our business afterwards. Okay, sorry I don't look too good. I just came from soccer practice. I would have looked a lot better than this. <laughs> And I don't smell too good either. <laughs> but whatever. Okay. So I'm just stand back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, all right. Hi, my name is Cameron Boyce, and I'm a senior at Richford Junior Senior High School. I am here to propose a change in the school policy that will allow seniors that have legally registered ATVs drive them to school and park them in the student parking lot. My dad, Scott Boyce, worked over the summer to open town roads and back roads in the town of Richford to those who own ATVs. The select board approved my dad's proposal, so it is now legal to drive ATVs on Richford Town Roads. Richford High School is a part of the town, so it would make sense that the rules for driving an ATV on the town roads should apply to the school as well. For many Richford students, driving their vehicle is a way they can express their personality. Driving a car and driving an ATV gives students a similar sense of accomplishment while also getting them to school on time. Giving senior students another option of transportation can also ensure higher attendance. Um, some, students don't, or some students don't have access to a car, but do have access to an ATV. Why should it matter the way of transportation as long as it is safe and effective? Some people might be concerned about safety, but ATVs that are driven on town roads have to be registered and insured and also have to abide by the same road safety rules as cars, such as driving, the speed limit, stopping for pedestrians, and wearing a seatbelt. Vermont laws state that an individual may not operate a vehicle on a public highway without a valid motor vehicle's driver, driver's license. When driven responsibly, ATVs are just as safe as cars. Also, restricting the privilege, restricting this privilege to seniors who are in good standing with the school who ha have their senior privileges will ensure that only the most mat mature students overall. This addition to the school policy has many benefits, as you can see. Any concerns you may have allowing students to drive ATVs to school are hopefully resolved by the information presented in this proposal. Thank you for your time. <laughs> so thank you. That was a great letter. That was thank well you. Done. Um, and great presentation. So we'll take that. We'll take that up with the board, and we'll and we'll talk about that. And we'll right. let you know. Kim, would you, like would you like to leave your letter? Would you like to leave your letter for the board because we have two members who aren't here? Okay, do you want this? Yeah, please. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Nice job, Kim. Thank yeah, you. Job. Nice thank job. you. Thank you. Job. Have a good meeting. You <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, and so now we have you folks. Can right. give another presentation? All right. Uh, I'm Chris Hoyt. Uh, I teach creative technologies um, along with civics here at the high school. Um, and Tom Barnum. Um, yeah, I'm Tom Barnum. I uh, emigrated here from Indonesia a year ago. I'm from England in the first place, but I uh, met my wife. She went to Enosburg High School way back when. Uh, and I teach design technology here in the high school uh, and some middle school classes. So we were asked um, by Ms. O'Brien to kind of give you guys a peek at some of the great things that we have students doing in our classrooms. Um, and I am going to start off by... Uh, a little bit about my robotics course that I teach. Uh, so I have one of our robots here. Uh, they are, can you guys pass that right around if you want to take a look at it? Um, these are EV3 Mindstorm robotics kits. Uh, the, the students actually assemble the robots all themselves and then we program them uh, to work independently. Um, so it's not remote control or anything like that. They have to do all the programming ahead of time and then run the programs. Um, it is a great project-based learning opportunity for them uh, that gives them real-world scenarios that they must think creatively and then use the programming and design elements that they've been taught to accomplish their goals. And I have a couple of videos of some of the robots in action. Uh, these are taken over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so this first one, uh, we create a maze, and then the students use um, an ultrasonic sensor that you can see, it looks like little eyeballs, that uses sound waves to measure distances. And they were trying to get their robots to navigate the maze successfully. So. Oh, 
So they're in teams of two, and they, they uh, all had to try to program it ahead of time without any trials. So they took all the measurements and everything. No one was successful. And that's OK in that class, because that's usually when they learn the most, is when, they, when it doesn't work out, because they have to do incident reports afterwards and analyze what went wrong, why it went wrong, how they could prevent it in the future. Um, the second one here. After that one, they had this challenge where they had to have a color sensor that could read the difference between the black and the white, and it had to follow the line. Um, and on this one, we had a competition to see whose robot could do it the fastest. So I was timing it and then recording um, their times. controlling that? It's, it's programmed ahead of time, so basically you can see how it kind of wobbles. Yeah. So it's basically one wheel is turning left as long as it's reading the color white, and then when it reads the color black, it turns left, and then as it sees more white, then it changes to, to driving left again. So it's just kind of like take a step this way until you see a certain color and then take a step the other way. So it's and it's all programmed ahead of time, so they just hit. Right, so they, they don't have anything that they're no. okay. Nope. So they're just, they just hit, they hit go, and then that's, it just does whatever, whatever. Um, what would keep, what would allow it to go faster or slower? So they could, depending on how many rotations between it checking, um, they can also uh, adjust the speed of the wheels. So if they go a little faster, sometimes it doesn't give enough time for the sensor to read accurately. So they run the risk of going too fast and it being less accurate, so it could go off track, and then it's kind of they're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and that actually happened a couple times where it would they would go real fast and it would go over the line, and then be in the middle of it, and it would just kind of go in a circle. So some students had that problem. Um, however, each time they're, they're getting better and better with understanding what the restrictions are, and oh, I can go, I have to go a little bit slower here or a little faster there. Um, it's it's really fun to watch them kind of. Uh, grow and, and understand that the details are, are more and more important every time. All right. Um, so that's robotics, and now um, okay, good design technology. Um, design, design tech is uh, a project-based class in woodwork, metalwork, uh, computer design orientated. Um, I give students problems that they then need to go about solving. Um, following a design cycle, so they'll research it, come up with some ideas, um, plan out how they're going to go about making their product, and then they make the product, and then finally evaluate it. And I think Chris does something similar with his classes. So last year, I try and keep the projects authentic, something that the kids enjoy doing. And one student said to me, he'd like really like to make a rocket stove, and then lots of other kids wanted to do that as well. And there's uh, quite a bit of science in there, and it also ticked the boxes on learning how to cut metal, uh, weld, and angle grind, and, and, and those sorts of things. So uh, the end result was the students had a little bit of a cookout on their rocket stoves that they had made uh, outside the workshop. Um, and it worked out pretty well, I think. Uh, did you have a video of this? I, uh, no, but the videos oh, okay. didn't download the video. Um, and I'd also like to take you down to show you what we've been doing this year, uh, some of the woodworking projects um, and the metalworking projects. We've, They've started making some rocket stoves. It's a great intro project um, that teaches the kids how to use the tools and machines safely. Um, and I'd like to show you some of the woodworking projects I've been doing as well. Yeah. So cool. last, guys, last guys, year we had a STEM night. I just need to tell them about the rocket stoves. So the kids that were presenting their work and um, uh, they were lined out up front cooking things. And we we had ordered dinner from Greenwoods. We ordered all this food and. Like, people would come in and they were like, well, we ate outside. <laughs> so, so next time, we're just going to have him do the Sorry cooking outside. <laughs> so if you guys are up for a quick little field trip, we'll take you down to the, to the shop and let you see some of the stuff that Tom's working So um, these boxes you see here, they're, they're just an intro project. It's not about making a box. Uh, it's about the students how to pierce the lids and how to cut uh, work with precision. And you can see these finger joints here. They've done quite a good job of uh, cutting those. My 
most of the students that come in here haven't ever picked up a woodworking tool before, so learning how to work in here safely uh, is the key thing. Um, and then, so this is the second project they've been working on already this uh, year, so the students. Um, the focus is uh, dado joinery, like housing joints, um, and now they know how to use most of the tools and machines. Uh, I've let them, rather than making a box, design their own project. So each student's come up with their own design, uh, and then they've gone ahead and made those in here. Um, this one will stay today, actually, so please take a look. This one's a, this one here's a, this one's a shelving. We've not quite finished this yet. Um, it's uh, for the front door. And then he's in my metal art class as well, so he's going to forge some books to go on the front of that down here. I think he's a ninth grader. This one. And this one here is a, like a fishing rod books. So he's, he's really into fishing. Uh, he wanted something to stand his fishing rods up in. So he stand up in there. And we have just a, a, a shoe rack here. Yeah. Uh, and the students learn, the side pieces there, the students learn how to en enjoy the, the banks uh, to make a wider pool. Michelle wants to bid on the shoe rack. I'm sure you can put some orders in. It actually, I want to say that there's been several projects around both schools that we've had a need and then we come down and the classes will build it. Yeah, yeah I've, I've put a big list on the board yeah, actually, the of, of projects that teachers have come uh, with needs for. So, uh, we work with the facilities crew and, and some teachers to help them make things um, come to learning and learning activity. These are the, this is the progress with the rocket stove so far. Okay, so, um, students, I give them a plan for just this basic part of the rocket stove. This is where you put the uh, fuel in, the wood. This is for the air, and obviously uh, the, where the heat rises, the convection and uh, your cook surface. The students then have to come up with a design for what's going to hold that source pan. Uh, they need to come up with a design for how to cover the, the feeding tube and some sort of air restriction here, so you can uh, have them down that fire if you need to, and they need to make it a little bit more stable. So it's a bit uh, unstable to make it safe to use. So, so I give them the design for that, and then they need to personalise it. And this is where we've got so far. Um, the students are learning how to weld, how to grind. Um, some of it's been plasma cut um, and, and bending, rolling that. Yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah, yeah. 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 Please ignore the stack of wood that I've got lying over there. Right? <laughs> no, that's pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to move into our um, uh, consent, consent agenda. We'll look at the previous minutes, policies, of the reading. Um, is there anything we want to talk about regarding the policies? Oh, yeah. Here, let's share. So, I think about when, we, okay. when did the when did you get your packet? I got my packet today. Okay, but then we're good. You got the right ones. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Oh, the mail? No, I actually, did you get it? The, I mean, the, I got it. So policies. But I don't, no, it says, to prepare for this meeting, please read this that will be handed out at the meeting. I thought she sent a second email with policy. Yeah, which I did not confirm. I have them printed out. Do you guys want to look at them? Sure. I was going to hand those up. I was going to say I can get like these boys. Well, Jane printed them out to be exact. Thank you. Yes, so it's actually. Do, I don't think that she has multiple copies, do you, Beth? No. What? You're not handing no, multiple can... copies. Oh, I only had the one. Do you want Sorry. to come back to this? Do we sure. want to maybe see if Jane could make a couple packets for us? Sure. Would that be okay? Okay. Okay. So um, let's move on to. Oh, we did that. Do we need to prioritize the agenda? Does the agenda order need to change for anyone? So that brings us to um, Morgan, financial business report. So um, a lot of what I have in there is informational. Um, a lot of field work is done. I have not seen a draft. I've not seen a lot of um, questions from the auditors for either Amesburg or Richford. So I don't expect that there will be any findings there. Uh, for FY20, I attached a financial report to your packet. There's not really a lot of useful data in there yet, but I just wanted to go over it because um, it's going to be new to some of you, completely new to some of you and somewhat new to all of you. Um, so the way it's set up is that um, first section is the revenue coming into the district. They're not split between the old Enosburg and Richford school districts. The only division we're looking at is um, between the new unified district and then revenue that's specific to the tech center because we have to report on that a bit differently. When you get into the expenses section, we have broken out building expenses by building. So you'll first see Enosburg Elementary, Middle High School and Richard Elementary, and then the junior senior high school here. Um, and then lastly, you're going to have a district wide level. Um, this is where your assessments, your special ed costs, your transportation, your school board costs, um, and the debt um, in terms of non specific borrowing. So um, notes that we borrow it in the summer for cash flow um, are all going to come in that section. Uh, and then finally, the tech center is, um, is broken out. In terms of the columns, the first column is your voter approved budget. Um, second will be expenses or revenues to date. Um, this month was through the end of September. The encumbrance column are for expenses that the software system knows that it's going to pay. So it will look at anybody who's got a contract that's somewhat regular and, and run that forward. Um, so it's generally very accurate for teachers. It's less accurate for support staff because it doesn't necessarily predict when they work overtime. Um, and work hours over their contract um, and things like contract services and supplies and, and expenses like that we aren't able to project forward. Budget balance is how much is left over after expenses and encumbrances. And then the last column is, is going to be where I think you're going to end the year. So once we get our tuition bills out, um, and see what kind of revenue we're getting there. Um, I will adjust the revenue section. Um, at some point in the next month, I'll kind of run through your staff salaries and see where we're gonna end up versus where we budgeted, because those costs are pretty much fixed now. And so I will make changes to this anticipated year-end column, and that's where you'll look to see if, um, if we're gonna worry about ending the year in trouble or if we're gonna have money left over to uh, to spend or send back to the voters. 
So if there are any questions on the format, I'm happy to try to answer those. Um, I gave you in your packet, again, the schedule for um, your budget meetings. Um, that's just really informational for you. I uh, hope to have a first uh, look at your budget at your November meeting, um, working on dates with administrators um, first individually to go over staff, and then we're going to meet as a group to kind of pull the budget together. Uh, I'm meeting with Beth tomorrow. I've met with Kelly, Joseph, Nate, Rachel so far, so I'll, I'll meet with Michelle sometime before uh, that first meeting. Uh, your annual meeting is February 20th. That's the from the floor uh, vote. That is really only on your side, electing clerk, electing the treasurer. Um, everything else should be Australian ballot, which is on town meeting day. What was that first date? I'm sorry. February 20th. February 20th, right. Okay. And that's in your packet. And you... Um, can choose to hold additional meetings, just um, purely informational for the budget around that um, date if you want. Okay. So the budget vote's happening earlier than that? The budget vote is happening March 3rd. And that's different from past practice? That's earlier for um, for Enosburg. That's how Richford has voted in the past. And I'll just uh, clue you in again uh, board petitions for those of you who are running for board seats are January 27th is when they're due. Um, does everybody know who's up this year? Um, definitely Mort is. And Amy is because they're filling terms. Uh, Rick's regular term is up. And Pam's regular term is up. And so four out of six seats are being voted. Wow. And remind us again that it's a combined total, so how many signatures? It's a combined vote. Um, it's actually 30 signatures from your town. From your town. No. Not from both. Okay. Okay. So Morgan, um, the 20th. Is that, are we having one meeting or two meetings? Is it one meeting and are it's we alternating years? Meeting. And then the board will have to have a conversation about, do you want to have a separate meeting so that you're in both towns? Okay. So where, um, is it going to alternate years? How are you doing that? Do you know? I, I think we can alternate. That. It's by year and I don't remember who's hosting. Okay. It but it alternates. It's okay. like an odd even thing if I remember right. Okay. That's what I thought it was. That's what, but I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that schedule? Mm -hmm. The only question I have is, so there's a line for school board. Is that like, is that like BSBA dues? Is that all of that? Yeah. Legal. What is that? Uh, it's, a, it's in the oh, with budget. In the, with the line. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> It's dues, it's a, the miscellaneous line. Yeah, legal, legal expenses. Legal that come expenses. Out of there. Oh, okay. Your salaries. Um, there'll be some insurance. Mm -hmm. Some of the insurance is put to that some line. The hiring stuff in that line as well. Advertising. Um, right. Maybe advertising. Right. Yeah, it's it's the advertising yeah. for hiring. I think advertising for Oh, oh it's in the, the school line. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And what else do you got? So you wanted me to bid out plowing. Mm -hmm. uh, bids were due today. I gave interested contractors the option of bidding for either town or both towns, um, and they could do it either as an annual bid or a per event bid. Mm -hmm. uh, we got three bids um, for Enosburg schools only. We had one person bid on both schools, but there wasn't a discount for taking both, so I'm gonna treat them separately. Uh, three bids for Enosburg. Um, Goodhue is the current contractor, bid 22,500 for the year. Um, Avery Stanley bid 38,000 for the year. 
and Coombs family from Richford bid 40,000 for the year. Um, for, that's for both. That's for each That's for that's Justine's bid. Um, for Richford, Coombs was the only bidder that submitted, um, and that was for 25,000 for the year. Okay. Um, I had asked the town to submit a bid again, and uh, I reminded Alan of that on Monday, and he said whoever is in charge of that at the select board level wasn't interested. Was not interested. Yep, so that was the only bid we got for Richford. So the town was not interested in plowing. Well, they're they're interested, but they aren't bidding. Oh, I see what you're saying. There, there's like, probably they're they're, they're not definitely interested. not happy. Oh, because it got bid. Yes. <laughs> so they would rather let it go than put a bid in. I, I don't know, but I just I got the vibe they're not happy. Oh. We needed they were supposed to do some work here, and they're like, well, we're busy. Yeah. They were going to help us. Yeah, they're but not. But even as a municipality, they have to bid. They know that. Well, they never. Have. <laughs> they never have. It's well, just okay. been. Well, yeah, and that's their practice. Okay. So, um, can I can yeah. I just add one thing about Combs? Um, Combs came up here and he asked me if it said something about sidewalks, and he said, and I, he was talking to the custodians, and in the past when they plowed. They didn't do the sidewalks. We were responsible right. for those. And so he asked me what he should do. And I said, if it were me, I would put in two bids. I would put in a bid with the sidewalks and I'd put in a bid without. Yep. And is that what he did? And he did that. And he would, um, for Enosburg to add on sidewalks, it would be another 10,000 a year. For Richford, it would be another 6,000 a year. Okay. Doug does our sidewalks. Right. Yeah, it was, and the other the other two bid on just the the roadway. Is there been any trouble with the current person mm -hmm. that is for right pretty good? Mm -hmm. There have been no complaints. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you like us to make that decision? That would be great. Okay. Snow's coming. So, any more discussion? Do you have any questions or discussion about your meetings? No. Yeah. Beth, what is the um, current cost? You said the town usually does it. 20000 for both buildings. That's how much? It's what we've budgeted for the last several years. For both? For, for both Richford right. Elementary and Richford High School. But they've got to do, like at Richford Elementary School, they've got to do the, the road ends, like at the begin, at the stop sign, or mm -hmm. actually, I think it even goes right almost to the almost to the back parking lot in here Corliss Corliss Ave is um, town road or village road so they would have to plow that so part of it would be they were right there anyway right so they what have are they to, upset yeah. about that we I mean it's always been just something the town has done and then they build us it's never been put out to bid I don't think they were happy that it was put out to bid and that's that's part of I know. I, I'm just. So is that one of our <laughs> options still? Is that one of our options still? Then I would. I would think. Which maybe we should talk with the select board. I would think that they would welcome twenty thousand dollars of revenue. Right. I could be wrong. I think. I think it would be more cost efficient for us to stay with them. Right. Right. It makes right. sense. So my leaning is to stick with good hue plowing, and then maybe. Uh, discuss with the select board if they'd be willing to pick up the contract as they have in the past. How does that work for the bid process? What's the legal? I don't know. Um, yeah. You have the ability to reject all bids. Right. Um, it's a little unorthodox to reject the bids that you got and take ones that you didn't get. Yeah. So, however, however, if it's cheaper. But could you open it back up though? Could you not accept this bid and then go explain to the town? Like this wasn't personal, this had nothing to right. do with we a were relationship we where save money we were trying to between right. both towns. And you were trying to follow the good practice and your legal practice of going out to bid for things over X amount of money. Right? Right. So I feel that the t 
historically speaking, I think it would be beneficial for you to know that from my experience, mm -hmm. the town of Richford views like many of the services they provide as us supplementing their revenue. Would you agree with me? Is that a good way to say it? So that, that's the best way I can say it, I think. So if that's, I, I don't mind reaching out to the select board and basically stating exactly what you just said, that we've rejected the bids. Would you be interested in putting in a bid for your 20,000 or whatever that you typically do? I mean, it would keep good flow between the town and the school. I don't know. What if they refuse to write one? Then we go from there. But you could, I, th I think you could reject all bids and just go with the prior. Couldn't you? you I would right. like to see us, we're trying to get some consistency about our practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we made a good faith effort to look in Enosburg at, you know, here's the contract that we typically do is put it out to bid. It's good practice, you know, as a consumer to see if you're in, a, in the right place with what you're paying for the product. I would like to see us go back and explain that to them, that this is a larger entity, and encourage them to submit a bid and not have us handle this differently because it was a, an upsetting mm -hmm. change. Like, I'd like to first have us try to get at the, the why piece of it, why we took this approach. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that we wanted to not give them the revenue, but we would hope that they would put the bid in. What do you think? Um, you know, on one hand, I'd be inclined to say you can reject all bids and open it up again completely um, on the basis that you only got one bid. Right. That significantly disadvantages the person who's bid because now everybody is going to know what their price is. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly oh, right. right. And if I knew I was only bid, I would probably raise it 10 grand. Just right. if you did it again. If I did it again, for this reason. I mean, I, There's me, no mm -hmm. I agree. With like I said, I, don't, I guess my feeling is that we take the most bit. Yeah, yeah, and then they explain to them, maybe. It's going to cost you more. Explain, go okay. explain why. You mean yeah. now and not reopen it? I, I, yes, I think so. I mean, I, you know, they could have. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that they could have reached out and told us. I know how they're going to. Yeah, I don't understand. Um, oh, yeah. I just feel a little queasy, we, queasy about it. Because we're not putting something up for bid into the. Not accepting the bid. <laughs> Would that be our practice down the road? If we if we have the ability to reject bids and we only get one bid, we only get one bid. would we not want to look at going back out and trying mm -hmm. to get some competitive bids? And we can can we only re if we decided to if could we reject just the the Richford contract except the Enosburg contract? Yes. Okay. Just divided them. And um, since nobody was interested in doing both, I mean, at a discount. Well, one, one was, was but, but he was right. the high, higher than anybody right, who right. did in Enosburg individually. Yeah, I think those are two. I think it's two separate decision points. Right. Okay. So. Um, I think we can we can make the decision on the Enosburg, mm -hmm. right? Um, so um, with going with the good hue. Um, good hue. So do I have a motion on accepting the good hue bid for Enosburg? I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, having no more discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. So now let's talk about the Richford. We could either take the lowest one, which would be um, Coombs for 25, plus six for the sidewalk, right? Well, we well, have been doing our own sidewalks. Okay, so no sidewalks. We have always done our own. Okay. Well, I, I mean, the town 
if it, there was a lot, yeah. they might drop their plow in front and help right. us out. But generally, we did all our own sidewalk. I was just one of the facilities guys was curious to see what they charge oh, rather than have yeah. his own staff do it. So we either um, go with Coons at 25 or we we open the Richford bid process back up with a phone call. I'd like to keep a good rapport between the school and the town personally. But right. I mean, I don't know. I'm <laughs> I'm <laughs> where where were you thinking? Yeah, I think um I think a smart keep the rapport. Okay. So at least extend it out to them and then if they don't they're not interested. Well then Extend out the invitation just a minute. Bit. Right. Correct. Right. Okay. So, um, and I, I would, I would be willing to do that. So, do I have a motion to reject the bids and open it back up? I'll make that motion. Having no more discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Right. All opposed. Okay. So I will give the Derby a phone call and have that conversation and then do we post the rest back in the paper how does that work okay what else so speaking of paying uh richford high school has a wood chip boiler okay. they currently have a contract with ivan maxwell to provide wood chips for the boiler he has had it for probably five years now. It was before you started up here, so at least five years. Um, and has contacted me um, proposing that we roll over the contract with the current price, which is something he's done since he first bid it. Um, I'm looking for direction from the board. Um, it's been a while since we competitively bid it, um, but we have had He's probably the third um, provider we've used, and the first two had serious issues with the quality of the wood chips. Um, and so your previous facilities manager and your current facilities manager both, I think, recommend that we just roll over the contract because of the, the quality of the product we're getting and that the price hasn't changed. Discussion? <laughs> uh, do I have a motion to continue the contract with the wood chip contract? I'll make a motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Alan Fletcher resigned as your district clerk. Um, you get to appoint someone in to serve until the March election. Um, Polly spoke with Billy Joe, who's the Enosburg Town Clerk, who said that she's willing to fill the term out. Um, the only qualification is they have to be an Enosburg or Richford voter. I sent Alan a thank you letter. Um, yeah, so do I have a motion to appoint Billy Joe, unless there's no other ideas, um, Billy Joe as the district clerk until March. I'll make it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Sorry, I have so much for you tonight. Um, <laughs> totally the Hyde Bit annual meetings are November 8th in Lake Maury. This is in conjunction with the School Boards Association annual meeting and the Superintendents Association annual meeting. Um, at the Visbit meeting, they will be electing two board members. There are no action items at the VHI meeting, unlike last year, there were quite a bit. Um, each member district can either um, appoint a representative to go and vote for them, or they can give that authority to the VHI and the Visbit board. Um, and I've got long motions uh, for each of the two entities in either direction. I don't know if any of the board members are planning on going to that conference this year. Um, Is that, that's not the November 7th. Yeah. Is it 7-8? Yeah, I'm at a conference at like Maury at 4, 5, and 6. 
I'd be You're down there for the week. <laughs> I'm, I'm not into staying. <laughs> <laughs> if no one is going, <clears throat> I am going to the conference. However, there's really not much on that agenda, and you have the ability to either give your proxies to the VHI board, or you could give your proxies to me and I could vote on your behalf. Okay. It is entirely up to you. Again, there's only two seats being elected at the VSBIT annual meeting, two of their board seats. Um, both are uncontested, uh, and there's nothing to vote on at the VHI meeting. Okay. Um, the other side See. gave it to the, to the current boards. Their meeting last week, and then the SU gets to do it next week. Okay. I'm fine giving the proxy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, two motions I'll need. One is to appoint as your true and lawful attorney the board of directors of the Vermont School Board Insurance Trust by majority vote with the power of substitution for it and in its name to vote at the annual meeting of the Vermont School Board Insurance Trust to be held on the 8th day of November 2019 or at any adjournment thereof with the powers it should possess if personally present through its authorized representative. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's all I pay for oh, saying that. hi. Did uh, you get that? Yeah, exactly <laughs> what you said. <laughs> and then the second motion would be to appoint as true and lawful attorney the Board of Directors of the Vermont Education Health Initiative by majority vote with the power of substitution for it and in its name to vote at the annual meeting of the Vermont Education Health Initiative to be held on the 8th day of November 2019 or any adjournment thereof with all the powers it should possess if personally present through its authorized representative. Second. Second. Are we doing health care yeah, negotiations under yours? We, either way. You can do it either under mine or yours. I was going to do it as an other. Okay. Um, so the, the commission that is in charge of negotiating health care benefits starting next July 1st um, was unable to come to agreement uh, of anything other than they want to punt it down the road for six months which they need legislative authority to do. Um, they went to fact-finding, and a fact-finding report has come out. I don't want people to think that this is likely where it's going to end up or even possibly where it's going to end up, but we wanted you to be aware of, um, of what the fact-finder is suggesting. Um, the next steps in the process are they go back to the table they continue to not um, agree, and then there'll be binding arbitration in December. Um, the proposal by the fact finder is that everybody, um, no matter the class in terms of licensed or non-licensed, admin, teacher support, food service, um, and whether or not they're full year or school year, um, everybody would go to an 80-20 premium split um, across the state. They s said they were not going to touch HSAs or HRAs and whatever's in your current agreement would continue on for two years. Um, there would no longer be any cash in lieu, mm -hmm. um, oh, which would be okay. a big change for us. She no, she didn't. No. Um, My ears would have been. Yeah. <laughs> and for us specifically right now, um, school year support staff can only get a single plan covered. Now everybody would be able to go up to a family plan. So Just the big change for us, cash and lieu would go away. Yep. Um, your support staff would now be eligible to get a family plan paid for 80% by you guys. Your year-round administrators and your year-round support staff, which is primarily your custodians, mm -hmm. um, a few secretaries, some of the folks in our office, um, would all move from a 90-10 to an 80-20 split. Okay. So it would be about a two to $3,000 pay cut for them. Okay. 
Yes. But we don't, that's just the fact finder just the report. Fact finder. So right. I just want to reiterate for our viewers that that's not, nothing has been decided. But what I've been told is that if there is an agreement and we end up having, having to go to binding arbitration, mm -hmm. it is due December 1st. Right. So we should be able to know this while we're still in the negotiation period with our teachers. And I'm going to talk about administrator negotiations under mine because it clearly has an impact on your administrators right. as well. Okay. Yeah, they said that it, it was going to be by December, which is good for budgetary questions. And, and, and that's 80-20, I'm assuming that's the gold plan. 80-20 of the dollar amount of the gold plan. So that's exactly what we have. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then lastly in your report, I put in a initial update of tuition kids. Mm -hmm. um, this has changed a little bit, um, and I don't have updated numbers, but I'm hoping to get tuition bills out to the sending schools either at the end of this week or beginning of next week. And at that point, there'll be a little bit of back and forth as those principals try to find parents in one of your two towns so that they don't have to pay tuition. Um, but I think uh, certainly by your next meeting, those will to be settled. And initially, it looks better than it's looked the last two years. Wow, that's great. One of it was come to the Eames Court meetings. Good. Anything else? Or do you... I think that's probably been enough. Perfect. Okay. So, when your report. Um. So one of the things that we've talked about regularly here is about our goals around teacher retention. And I did, I sent out the teacher retention survey electronically to each of you. I have copies if anybody would like to take one uh, to look at. So there were, there were things that our administrators have also gotten to take a peek at this as well. So this information is helpful. We now have two years worth of data, and I think that it's helpful, helpful for us to tune into that as we head into negotiations with our teachers. Morgan, you don't have the, the bar graph, do you? Could you project it? I mean, what percentage this year? is that for the responses? Very low. I mean, yeah, how many did you? So we had 14 responses, and that's something I wanted to tune into, and we had in the 40s four people who, had, who left. Uh, so it wasn't a great, yeah. they're leaving. Some people are not as interested in giving us that feedback, but I think that there are some nuggets that we can take out of the feedback that we did get. I'm just wondering if it's possible to conduct an exit interview the day somebody had to That was actually suggested by the time we were in the conference. I thought that was a really good idea. Mm -hmm. I didn't under, under most circumstances. I think that's a really good idea. But not by one person. Is that like. Right. I mean, it would probably have to be a couple of people in each building conducting. So I think that I know someone made that suggestion. I think we've talked about it the and, before. Right. We've talked about that. I don't know. I, I, I want to think about like consistency too of your feedback, and I think that some of the feedback that people want to give might be about my office, or some of the feedback that people want to give might be a school level feedback. And one of the questions I have is about the comfort level of doing that when you're being face to face interviewed by someone. This is, I mean, it's not always, sometimes we can tune into who it is based on what they're saying. Um, but there's more of a feel of anonymity right. in this. But what if you, what if somebody that did the interview was not you or right. not a building principal? I, I was um, going to say it would have to be a, a neutral party because right. they're, they're leaving not by their own choice with any of the administrators. They may not give a, right. they may not feel comfortable giving a answer about their feelings. Or, right, right, right. I mean, I understand. Or even if they're not, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I agree. It's not but impossible. They, is the answer. It's the question of what will we get out of it, and it, we'd have to really tune into the who and the how piece of it. But if they were leaving, 
if I'm even care of it. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Maybe. I wonder if there's like a, you know, it used to, we used to have a checklist we had to go through at the end of every year, and it was like, did you turn in your keys? Right, did yeah. you do this? Did, and maybe one of those is, did you take the exit survey? You know, and the fact that before you left, you had to do these certain things, and maybe taking the exit survey was one of the criteria. Let me bring that back to my, my central office team mm -hmm. and see what we can come up with. So we also have some data that Morgan has projected up there. So last year we had tuned into when teachers are leaving the organization, in what year of service are they? So you have the numbers across the bottom that represent how many years they've been with us. Um, and then if you look at the, the bars on, on the left side, you can see that those are the number of people's, people who are leaving. So it's most common that teachers are leaving us in year two. It's more around 27, I would say. Of the, how many years, Morgan? Five years? Four years oh, of data? Five years. Okay. So we're still in the same place. The data hasn't really changed from last year that the majority of the people that we're losing are leaving us in years one through four. That's because they need experience to get a job in Chittenden County. Mm -hmm. yeah. You recognize that as one of the yeah. factors. Mm -hmm. So this is the intention behind giving you this data is to think about, we're planting seeds again as we go into the negotiation process for our, a starting place. What is it that we're, we're finding is important for us to focus on? Um, so this is the real, it has the wrong year, but it is the right information, right? Right. Okay. So I somehow only ended up with two copies of this from the last meeting, so if you want to take it and pass it around, on one side is the Enosburg Richford um, UUSD information, and on the other side is the NMV. And on the NMV side, it also includes our grant funded positions in FNESU. So that's trying to get a sense of within each building, what are the seniority levels of your staff? And Morgan is also projecting it up there. So looking at you know, the focus and the things that we're working on, if you think about impacting change over time, and you look at some schools that have a very small blue, that's telling us that the majority of the staff has five or fewer years in that building. So this is something that we're very in tune with in terms of retention and impact on student learning as we're turning over staff. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can find it and give it back to you. Any other questions? move us if there are no yep. other questions yep, about good. this. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is administrator negotiations. So the majority of... I got one question. Oh, sure. Uh, so is there anything that you, you can see going through that that had like, changed anything from year to year, year, or is it still the same as far as teacher That we've changed that have impacted their perception or that no. have impacted the numbers. I don't know that we could say that after one year. Like, I think that we need at least three years of data before we come up because it's the N is so small in this. So pretty much the same number of people left last year, isn't it? Or left this similar number, a similar okay. percentage. Um, the difference is we are including children in this year's data. 
They have quite a few teachers who left this year as well. So I think it's going to take a, take some time for us to impact change. You know, in terms of it's not all, all about compensation. There are other factors as well. So, so a lot of we're relocating. Which is yeah. So I'm going to talk at the SU meeting about some of the strategies that we're putting in place in terms of attracting people to the area because there's there's two sides to this problem. One is that we can't attract people to come out here. And two is once we get them, a lot of the people that we're hiring, we're hiring and they're commuting in from Chittenden County. Um, we have carpools that are coming from St. Albans, Colchester, Milton, Burlington, Winooski, all over the place. And that's not wrong in some of them will say to you, we have to work in schools outside of Chittenden County. And the Chittenden County superintendents will own that as well. Like they don't look at brand new teachers. They have the ability to look up the chain and look at hiring teachers with, with more years of experience. And I'm not sure what we can do to impact that piece about the retention, but what I think we could do a better job of right now is the recruiting. And we're gonna be talking about that at the SU level. We have some interesting partnerships that we're exploring. We, we had a meeting with UVM last night about trying to get kids from UVM's um, elementary and secondary ed programs out here to do their student teaching. And they told us that about 80% of the kids who are in their program are actually out of staters. So transportation is a big piece about getting them up here. However, we try to think creatively outside of the box. And one thing that they um, asked us to consider was reaching out to our staff members to see if people would be interested in doing homestays so they could earn a stipend for providing room for you know a student teacher to live with them during the week or providing a travel stipend for a carpool that's coming from Chittenden County anyway to get some of these student teachers up here. So our hope is that maybe we can get them early and, and that would help with the recruiting piece and, and try to get them interested in coming here and staying here. But I think that there are two separate sides of this and in terms of the retaining piece, there's a part that we can con impact and control um, by changes that we're doing here and there's a part that I don't foresee we're going to be able to control in that motivation to be closer to the more urban part of our state. It's like back to the one home schoolhouse, right? Didn't the teacher like move into town and live with the family? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, See, we're trying to get back around. as creative <laughs> as we can be about that. I think another thing we can do is to um, work on kids in the, at the high school to become educators. Mm -hmm. A lot, um, we have, right now I have a, a boy who I think is going this year to be a PE teacher. And I was talking to him and I said, you will get a job in the state of Vermont if you want to stay here. If you, and he said, could I be a high school PE teacher? I said, yes. And so right now, like in the, and then a kid from last year is going to be a math teacher. They will get jobs mm -hmm. locally. So I think that um, our high school students are a huge resource and um, are a huge uh, piece of solving that pro a puzzle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. La last year I started reaching out to colleges and going, I went to St. Yeah. Mike's and did um, a presentation for all the student teachers. Um, kind of did a trade-off after the new contract came out. Uh, free advice on how to have a good job interview and what the first year of teaching is really like in exchange for talking up what's better about our contract than any other contract they're going to be offered in the state. Mm -hmm. um, and we got a couple um, mm -hmm. hires from that. So I'm going to do it again this yeah, year. We also have other recruitment strategies that we're putting into place. Courtney Fletcher is going to be doing recruitment work at college and career fairs and we've never tried that strategy before. So she's doing the same kind of thing that that uh, Rachel just talked about and that she's creating a booth and she's talking about some of the benefits, some of the unique things that we embedded into our negotiations to try to address some of these pieces. Um, we have reached out to some of the colleges in this part of the state to try and Northern New York to try to pull people in earlier into the um, programs. We're also looking at how are we advertising and is there a way that we can be more enticing when people are looking for those positions with how we're advertising. So so that's definitely about recruitment and then the retention piece. Like I, I read some about like 
some mentoring programs are really good. Some they you know may need some work, mm -hmm. um, like breaking in, uh, breaking into the click, like all of those things. The culture and climate piece, I guess, too. Right. Like, with something we could control. And yeah. that's one of those pieces that I think we need to break down at the school level. Yeah, no, exactly. I need to be giving that feedback to administrators right. individually. I have not broken it down right. at the school level data yet. I've just looked at it collectively yeah. so far. Right. So, I mean, I think that there's some other factors in there and Rachel kind of tipped to, one, our N was really small this year and sometimes people are not leaving because they wanted to leave. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I can read voice in, in right. some of those things. It's not as easy for peop other people to be able to read voice right. in some of those things. But I do think that there are, are bits of information that we can take and as administrators we can work on in terms of like the mentoring piece. I think they give us some really good feedback yeah. about the mentoring piece mm -hmm. and how we can maybe beef it at the school level because right. we focus very much on the SU, SU level part of the mentoring process, but not as many connections at the school level. And I think the other thing, you know, when you're looking at this data, Enosbury Elementary School stands out and has stood out for a long time. I'm going to tell you one more thing that I intentionally did, and a lot of it is thanks to talking to you a, a number of different times over the years, because Montgomery was the vision I had back then. but. We had the benefit of having a couple of people retire or leave at different grade levels, and I intentionally assigned a veteran teacher that was strong <clears> at that grade level to a newbie going in and partnered them up intentionally in three different grade levels, and it paid off because they really felt like they had that support. And you know, I think that's another piece if you're lucky enough to have a couple of grade levels per grade to kind of think about and do and try to project ahead along with trying to really make sure you're constantly admitting this whole, we're in this together. If one grade level is not doing well, the other ones get impacted and push that out everywhere. And so many of our buildings do that, but for whatever lucky reason I'm getting, I, I really have been able to keep people. Well, I, I think it's more than luck. Like you've had a strategy that's been visible to me also for many years. Like Michelle has worked very hard to develop her own local teachers as well. So there have been some some people who have gone from other positions into education through Michelle's support and her strategy has, has very much been about hiring local when you know they're comparable candidates yeah. and I think that that has paid off for you I over agree. time. I think that I'm hopeful that we can continue on that path there. I think that we need to work like Beth talked about, like we can't talk about one without the other because it, we definitely want to retain our teachers, but we know we're going to be losing teachers. We have several teachers who are on that higher um, number of years experience level. Like we have quite a few people that are approaching retirement age and the recruitment part of new people coming into the profession. I think that that's a big deal yeah. that we need to address as a state. There are fewer and fewer people going into teaching. Right. It's a it's a really challenging profession to go into. and. Um, there are fewer people going in, and I do think that we could be working smarter to, to encourage some of our own students to be thinking about that future career. Sounds good. Uh, in terms of administrator negotiations, I want to just tag on to what Morgan was talking about, about um, the impact to your administrators on the bargaining that's help happening at the state level as well. I would typically encourage you to begin bargaining with your administrators Soon, like November I think that it's wise for you to push that out and re request that your administrators bring you um, proposals for your December meeting so that you can look at all of your comparables so you've got uh, several administrators that you're negotiating with this year so you have I'm gonna read down this list because some of these are our names that you some of you may not know so you're negotiating with Chris Brigham, the AD at Enosburg High School, Nate DeMar uh, from Cold Hollow, Joseph from EFHS, Robert Fair from, he's the Dean of Students here at the high school in Richford, Nate Jingris from, he's the Tech Director at Enosburg High School, Katie Jewer, she's the SAP Counselor at Richford, uh, Nelson Mayhew, the AD from Richford, Beth O'Brien. Wait, hold on just a second. So these are just negotiated contracts they're due this year. But they're not all administrative contracts. 
They're all administrator contracts. Oh, the SAP's administrator? Yes. Oh. These are administrator contracts. Oh, it has okay. to do with your number of days um, in your in your contract. Right, okay. And they're not, it's different than the teacher licensure. Right, okay. Um, Peter O'Connell, your senior instructor at EFHS, Rachel, middle school principal, Luke Cotero, TC, Larissa, uh, Enosburg guidance director, and Allison, Richford's guidance director. So they're not, they're not building, they're not principals, but they're contracts that you negotiate differently than you negotiate your your teacher contracts. So they, they're falling under that category of administrator. They're outside of the teacher's union. So you have some negotiating to do, but I don't think it makes sense for you to do it yet. Okay. Does that make sense? Like we want to be able to, to look at, they're going to want to be able to look at what's the whole package. And so by December, we need, the, we need those letters? Their proposals. Their proposals, yes. I mean. Do you think the um, <laughs> binding arbitration is going to be done December 1st, or they're That's submitting, what I'm is. each side is submitting their proposal on December 1st? I was told binding arbitration, like the report from the binding arbitration was due December 1st. Were you told something different? So the whole the thing said last night that they had um, scheduled the meeting for November 1st. And that the report had to be by law within 30 days of that. So it has to be. From the binding arbitrator. Yeah. From the binding arbitrator, from the day of their scheduled meeting, which was November. Nicole was the one that told me that as well. Did she say whether on November 1st the two sides' proposals will be public or available to school boards? Oh, that she didn't say whether it was public or not. She just said the she proposals would be given to them. They would have to. They would have the meeting and decide within thirty days what one they're going to choose. Mm -hmm. Actually, did she say something about public? Which she goes, which just went public. I remember. She but what was she saying? About that, but too. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Okay, I'll certainly ask her. I think the fact finder just went. Yeah, maybe it was the fact finder. It was the fact finder. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have. Oh wait, I actually do have a question. Okay. We're, we don't do those all in one meeting, correct? Because <laughs> well, yes, I would not want to be last. Let's put it that way. <laughs> or maybe you do want to be last. <laughs> I don't. So we've never done. Them yeah, that many. With two communities, right. so we could. Think about how you want to do this. Like, do you do you want them to submit the proposal in writing, so that you get an opportunity to review it? They come in and chat with you, and that sounds good. I think that sounds. Awesome. But we got to do that. We, we got to do that. Enough. Two, two, yeah, we can't do that one. At night. least two. Oh no. no. But so, but maybe they're present. Do you want them to present to you at one meeting, and then you negotiate at the next, or? What do you want to do? Do you want to I schedule want, a separate like negotiation meeting? I like the proposal, and then we might have to do two meetings in December and split them. Do you want to schedule that in advance, or do you want to see how you do? Like, we could also plan to be really light on our board agenda. I mean, you're going to be doing budget stuff, but yeah. the rest of us could choose to be really light on the, in that month. So if we can get the proposals, can we do the proposals, get the proposals in December, and then meet in January? I think it's too, too late, late for you okay. because your budget Budgets. needs to be finalized. Right. I think you you want to wrap this up so in December, or early January November? at the latest. I think we split the group late. in half. Yeah. Do one one night. An extra meeting. And then one another night, like proposal and negotiate at the same time. Okay. You know, just if there's ten people there, we take five one night and then. Following night, whatever it is, we take the five. I wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Lucky. That's how many is the most we did? We did like three. We did four or five last year. Yeah, we've had more than three. We don't have to talk about health care. That is true. Oh. Maybe. Maybe. Wow. <laughs> I've already done some alignment pre-work. Oh, so okay. Some so you think we can have them when they have them? No, 
I, I think you can accept your proposals on one night and you can maybe you do all of your administrators. You. How about this? Yeah. You can do your administrators on that first meeting so that if you can get through all of your building level administrators on that meeting, you your separate meeting would be the other people and you're not asking your administrators to be out a second time. Yeah, yeah that's wise. Unless you guys object. I'm happy to come to <laughs> And you might not need to meet with people. You might right. look at their proposals and some of them That's you might just accept. That's what I said. You might accept them all right. just right. so right. first. Like, yeah. Most of these people don't ever attend like, your meeting. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. So I'm just going to tell them they have to bring them to the December meeting, the proposals. And it maybe if we have a need to pull people in, if we don't accept something in the written proposals, then we can schedule a second one. Okay. Now, Lynn, are you um, going to communicate that to all these yep. people? Okay. I didn't know if we were supposed to no, write that, them down. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Hold on. Joseph, do you want me to do the personnel under mine? Sure. That would be fine. So we, we do have um, one resignation to talk about from Enosburg High School. Do you have the letter? I have the Okay. Do you want to pass the letter this way? So Nikki Cribb um, currently teaches Enosburg High School. Uh, do you, what would her job title be? It's uh, quite an eclectic <laughs> yeah. thing. Um, she teaches um, an adulting class. She, teaches, she oversees the ninth grade academy. She's... Um, which takes up a lot of her work. Um, she works as support with the ninth grade team, and she has a myriad of other things that she does. With she, her main focus this year is getting every senior to the finish line, so we can have a hundred percent graduation rate if possible. So she's been a huge support for seniors all the way through from ninth grade to twelfth grade. But she's ninth grade academy teacher, but she's the twelfth grade class advisor okay. as well, which is separate from her teaching duties. So Nikki is actually asking to be released from her contract. Um, she would like to leave. It, she's made a request, I think it was January 2nd January or 3rd. January 3rd, I think is what it says. Yeah, January 3rd. So yeah. she's making a career change. Yeah. She's moving into another field. And I actually knew this was coming. She had spoken with Eric about it last year. Um, and it had been a really long application process, mm -hmm. though. One thing that I'm tuned into is the the benefit of having her come back for that day after the holiday. I'm not certain that that makes any sense to do right. a second year of employment. Like that's another whole fiscal year yeah, exactly. for us. Like I think you could accept that letter and have it be effective. Effective December, the last day of oh, school. December 31st. Like right. before, well, right. a break. December 21 oh, or whatever yeah. that day We're is. not usually in school on the 31st. Right. It's like a holiday thing. Yeah. Just the business office is going to have to do yeah. so the paperwork. Before the holidays. Right. 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 No, that makes sense. You just transition there. Right. Is that anything you have to move around? I think you just need to um, make a motion to accept her resignation. So, a motion to accept the resignation um, and post the data to December 20th. Is that the date? 21st would be your Saturday of 41%. Okay, so the 20th, effective December 20th. Right. I'll make that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. What is USCIS? I'm just yeah. going to say, what's USCIS? INS. Oh, oh, okay. Fancy Oh, customs immigration. Yeah. So I, I don't have anything under hiring. I do have something under um, the communication piece, Northwest Access TV. Mm -hmm. I made a request earlier. They had originally made a request to you to to have a fee structure based on per meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent a letter which should be included in your board packet that they're actually shifting to like a per capita model oh, yeah. for their communities. So the request is 763 for the year in order to continue taping and publishing the meetings online. Um, That's in lieu of the $50, 50 yes. per meeting. So it's 100 more. So what is the, what the changes that are we now asked to contribute 
Oh, yeah. Okay. 763? Yes. Okay. Do I have a motion to um, approve the 763 per year? I will make that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I have nothing under student. I have um, some SBAC data, but I want to hold on to it. I'd rather do it at the end of the meeting because I think your principals have some that they're going to send okay. out. Um, so I'll come back to that. I want to just tip you that um, at the SU meeting, which is happening next week, I'm going to be making, um, we're going to be talking about retention and recruitment of teachers. I'm going to give you some more detail about some of those uh, strategies that we're putting into place. The other uh, thing we're going to be talking about is I'm going to ask the board to make a motion to approve an, an early ed director position, a school year position. And we've already talked about that at this board level, so I just wanted to tip to that. The other piece that um, we've talked about this at the NMV side is around facilities director position. So one of the things that very clearly takes up a lot of time for building administrators is dealing with the facilities, especially, um, I think it's more common with some administrators than others to get into situations where we're asking our principals to know things about heating systems and water systems and plumbing and things like that because they're the ones who are, you know, taking those bids in and making decisions about work plans. So we're very reactive with how we're dealing with some of our buildings and it makes good sense for us to be looking more proactively at someone that has more comprehensive knowledge around facilities management um, to see if there are efficiencies that we could that we could realize in terms not only of just work that needs to be done, responsiveness to work that needs to be done, and whether or not that's the right scope of work, but also proactively around prevention work. Like there are definitely some um, maintenance things that could be happening that aren't necessarily happening because there, there, there isn't the same level of um, knowledge. The knowledge base isn't consistent between all of our schools and the building principals are being asked to work outside of their areas of expertise. So the conversation is going to, could go any number of ways. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask the SU board to consider is, is this model, if you're going to consider a facilities director model, will you want to consider it at the SU level and have it be one person who's in charge of like the 10 campuses? Or would you want to look at it at um, the district level? So you have one person who's really looking at all of the campuses on the Enosburg Richford side and another person who's focusing on the NMV side. Or would you want to look at it on, like, I just have questions about the Enosburg Richford side to me. It feels um, a little more uncertain. Like, do you, right now, you do not have a model where someone is in charge of all of the Enosburg campuses. Richford really does have a model where they have one person who's in charge of both campuses. But the conversation at the SU level is going to have to do with the economy of scale. Like, at what level do you want facilities management at? Do you want it at the SU level, district, or by town from, from your perspective? So we'd like you to have that conversation here so that your SU members are prepped for that conversation at the SU level. How many buildings total? Yeah. How many buildings total? We have 10 campuses. So I believe we have 10 buildings, I'm not counting out buildings. And so if it was at the SU level, it would be more of managing your head custodians kind of deal. In doing some work around um, like project. Like project management contract, stuff yeah. and also like the prevention work like right. making sure that you know that our HVAC systems are are properly cleaned right. and you know yeah, to, yeah getting on some sort of a maintenance schedule rather than the reactive place that we sometimes so Rachel yeah. how many hours a day do you spend that building stuff well not many right now because Doug is really good at that maintenance like projecting out like he he schedules a lot like those doug is a facilities manager even if that's not his title 
he really does that sort of thing. However, if something arises in the moment, like there's a leaky roof or something, or broken bathroom door handle, then I'm spending some time like problem solving. I'm not a great person to solve, like to fix it, but I can find somebody who can help with it in the moment. But it really depends on stuff coming up. But we're lucky to have somebody who really does that. I don't think for Enosburg High School, it makes sense to have additional oversight in that capacity because we have somebody who's already has a plan for that scope and sequence of maintenance. At your building level. At our building level, who is like doing things, planning things out and... What about Richburg? I know Gary used to be good at that. I don't know about the new guy that be right. So Gary, Gary and I worked really well and as you know, I have a unique budgeting technique and so we we would have a list of things that needed uh, to be done and if there was money left left at the end of the year we would do this 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 um, there was a plan starting back several years ago to uh, for all the asbestos abatement at Richfield Element elementary school and for the most part that has been done a certain amount has been budgeted but we do have somebody new who is and they're there are a lot of things that need to be done. The elementary school needs a new roof. As you know, I presented uh, the list to you last year. Fuel tanks need to be removed. So there um, are several things that need to be done, but we've been budgeting a certain amount every year and trying to work within that budget. But even Michelle. like contract. So it's been a unique couple of, we've, we've got a B problem in our, one of our classrooms. You probably may have heard, hopefully it's not in the Those yellow jackets? Yellow jackets? Yeah. We had the same problem a couple years ago and yeah. they were up in the tile. They'd gotten in somehow and made a nest above the, in between the tile and the roofing. I don't know where they all came from all of a sudden. But yeah, yes, they're, they're so, so many. So I'm yeah. not a good one to ask this week because I think I get more. I've smacked, I've vacuumed or whatever because <laughs> I've had to clear this classroom out. We have a, a student allergic so you can't put them in there until I get a handle on it. So this is not a good week. <laughs> ask her how she's right. fumbling the facility. I don't think I go more than, I mean, really daily stuff, maybe 20 minutes where you've got to just consult different things that right. might be happening. But I would agree. With that. We also have an older facility and lots have been, lots done over mm -hmm. the years. Um, but so I, I feel like in the, in the end, just maybe, I didn't think we needed some food service help and oversight, but it's been wonderful to have that as well. So sometimes I don't know what I don't know could be a benefit, and that's sort of where I would fall with this. So. Yeah, I mean, Jeff does most of it. So, I mean, we do it himself, yeah. but he's really good at, I mean, we share equipment with Doug. So, and we give equipment to like Berkshire. I don't know that guy's name right off the top of my head. But Lynn, Lynn McAllister. Lynn, and so, yeah. You know, Jeff's really good at making sure people are getting some of the equipment that we might have. Um, I would bill him for that. So, what's that? We don't bill him for that, but we didn't give our tractor out too much, and that's why he just forgot to buy a tractor. But um, I've heard that you had to deal with some community fixes. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, we might want to relook at that lease at some point too. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said the school board's in charge of paying for that. I don't know if you guys have a big, that big of a budget. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think we tried to unload that building and nobody was in on it. But <laughs> now you're wishing you did. Now that they moved in, maybe they want to buy it. No, we wanted to buy it before, but people were not, they were not kosher with that. Um, yeah, so. Which word elementary? So, since I've been there in July, um, I have not personally had to deal with anything regarding the facilities. I've dealt with, I've had a lot of conversations with um, the, the, the custodian maintenance person that Beth and I both share regarding the projects that need to take place there and trying to do some kind of prioritizing around those. And then the things that have to happen immediately, like some of the things that we discovered that needed to happen immediately, but a lot of that has been conversation. So how would a, just one, how would it work if we had to hire one for I mean, so I'm not suggesting one way or the other. It, there is a little bit of a difference um, between the two districts. So when you have building base principles on the other side, they're they're asked all the time, like, here's what the person thinks you need to do. You need to change these valves. It's going to be eight thousand dollars. 
Um, and they're, at, they're called upon to make those decisions about like, is that the right thing to do? Is that the right scope of the work to do? So it's about managing some of those pieces. The other piece is looking at it as a, like planning out as a system, like here are the priorities within the system. Right now, you just ask your principals to talk about each of their individual buildings and everybody has somebody kind of in that role in their buildings. I think Enosburg Middle and High School share. Yeah. The Richford person has both of those campuses as well, but Michelle has someone sec separate and Nate has someone separate as well. But no one's really looking at Enosburg as a whole or Enosburg and Richford as a whole. So is that the a board function? What do you mean? I said, is it, well, so what I mean is, so is, is that a board function that you know, Joseph needs X and Rachel needs Y, and shouldn't we be prioritizing what goes where? Well, I'm. I think that that is at a level of detail that doesn't. I don't think that belongs at the board level. I think that if you're talking about yes, I want you to be able to weigh in at the board level about those things, but you have board seats that are going to vary widely, and I don't know that you're going to always have board members that have the kind of background knowledge that you need as well. Like. The example that I gave about valves was real, and it was about the valves were installed incorrectly. Well, someone convinced someone, however many years ago, that's how they were supposed to install the valves, so we paid for that. And now someone's saying those valves weren't installed correctly, now they're asking us to pay for it again. Yeah, like, who do we have above that's looking at it and being able to say, you know, yes, this is the right scale of work, or this is not the right scale of work? But I'm not sure a facilities person would be capable of that either. Depending on what it is, I think you know. It I mean, on who they, you they, get. they could they could take the time and say, go and say that this work is not done right. You need to come back. Mm -hmm. I guess my from my perspective, I I am not sure that at least this district at this point in time. I think there's other places I would rather spend that money. So but I'm not. Can certainly be persuaded otherwise. But. Would you want to look at how you're doing your own district, though? Yes. So, so in terms of management and planning and foresight, like there's there's not that collaboration happening on this side. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. yeah. Right. But even thinking about like the pa paving contracts, like that will get kicked down the road forever because it's it's not a priority for us. It feels like ever, whereas it could be a priority for somebody who has their eye on that ball. Do you know what I mean? But and basically figures out what it would take, like all of those questions, I feel like that your building administrators aren't going to do, but somebody needs to do. But I, yeah, I don't know, and I don't know the answer, but I feel like there's lots of that stuff that needs to get taken care of. And I think, I don't know how one person, I mean, if you were thinking whole district-wide, how one person could possibly manage 10 different buildings or even like at an SU level that seems right like it seems like well I think that there are, so what's happening right now at the state level is that conversations are happening around facilities management there's a really pesky fly around here right now they're having lots of conversations about facilities management and Visbit and the VSBA have a pilot project um, this year that they have put into place where they're trying to develop facilities management training programs. So it's not just about hiring someone who's who's really good at the maintenance of the building, right? Like it's the management of of all of it. And there's a skill set that people need to have in order to be able to effectively do that. So what they're trying to, to pilot is that training program to develop that, to really be clear about job descriptions and how building level uh, staff very differs from the organizational level of of managing that vision for keeping track of your or caring for your facilities and grounds. So this seems different but it's not. So the early childhood ed position that is an SU position. Right. Well that's what I'm gonna propose. Oh. And then this could be two districts. You could say we're not interested. Right. NMV has has already tipped that they're interested. Mm -hmm. um, so you could say we want to keep it exactly as it is on this side, or you could say let's not lose this line of conversation and think about do we want to do something for this side, or do we want to look at what we currently have and look at it by town. 
Can I just add something here since I've sure. worked on both sides? Um, in Montgomery, I shoveled the roof. I plunged toilets. Mm -hmm. I, I did, like, I know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's a different world than it is, I think, in Enosburg or Richford because you do have a lot more support here. So I can see why they want to hire somebody. I'm not sure there's a need here. That's my opinion. But could, and couldn't just like if one like say Montgomery, couldn't they just hire their own person? Yeah, well, it's not enough full so time work. But you're you're trying to get at the efficiency part of this too, and being really thoughtful about about how you're ma maintaining your buildings. Like you're. I don't think it makes sense for us all to hire someone at that level right. for each of our individual schools because then you have an economy of scale issue or that there's, it, it would be great like when Beth's saying she's, she's shoveling, like I also was a principal on that side yeah. and I spent a lot of time managing a water system that that school is the owner of and doing things like pulling water line out of the ground when it's 20 below, like you just have to when, when you're in that kind of situation. It might be different on this side because of how many staff members you have or how much support you have on this side. Just having somebody full time. Mm -hmm. right. Well, right. I, I think that yeah. um, you're getting at something, but I'm wondering if it's hiring for Enosburg Richford or if it's being planful. And if you hire somebody for NVM and Doug and Larry yeah. and Jeff. Jeff and Jerry work together like if we're building capacity in our people to be able to do the planning so i, I i'm not sure for enosburg richard it's about hiring if or if it's about building capacity within them in order to be able to do that efficiently i don't know that's just my like have them like meeting yeah on a regular basis right to right out. Well, like if one of them has an expertise in electrical, another one has a plumbing yeah. background, maybe they right. could help each other out if that type of issue arises in their school rather than having to find a contractor. And maybe that's a good committee thing for us, the school board. Hmm? So we can have I mean, maybe they should meet committee, monthly. Building committee. Facilities. I was. <laughs> that's what I heard him asking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what before. to think about <laughs> that, Rick. Like, <laughs> You really want that level of, of work and oversight of what's happening in the buildings? I, it's I don't not know so much high up elevation. It's not, it's not a matter of really, it all has to come together, right? I mean, so it's all part of the whole system. And so, it, yeah, I, I think that's part of the school board's responsibility a little bit. I'm being on the select board, like I'm, I'm done talking about paving and plumbing all of it and the fact that I really like it when our directors like the road commissioner comes and says here are your options for paving which one do you want to do like that I feel like I, I don't know the minutia I think you guys have a meeting next week where yeah. you're going to be working with someone from the VSBA to talk about board training and thinking about what level should your work be at in this newly merged UUSD. Right, which so I think that this may be bringing this up there yeah. to say like is this the right kind of level that the board should be at but what I'm saying is I, I what I really wanted to do today was to spark the conversation about do you want to look at this at the organizational level here or do you want to leave it in the individual places that it is so you have someone looking at your building but not at that that system. What? Well, it doesn't necessarily you know. have to be at the SU. No, no. That's what I'm so saying. So take that off the table. Right, I, I that's think that's saying. on the table. Right. Yeah. Take that so, off the table. And then as far as like whether it's a district, we know that NMV is. And they can do it. So they can do, they can do that. Yeah. We could look at our budget, we could look at our needs, and we could go to this training and make it maybe a more informed decision. Mm. Okay. And potentially have one for the district or not at the district level yeah not as i think if we did anything it would be at the district level at the district level state not or building so or, today yeah, or campus and have our yeah. yeah lead custodian I whatever their title that. is I okay. collaborate and, and work jeff, more together. I mean, jeff definitely said jeff francis said that if there was an interest 
and exploring what that could look like yeah. at the organizational level, he'd be willing to partner with you. Okay. I can't describe it the way that Jeff and Visbit can describe it because I have not done that training or, or looked even deeply at what that exactly would be. But it might be worthwhile down the road for us to come back to this and have the conversation of whether or not you want to look more deeply at that facilities management level. And the last thing I just want to say is about um, as we're moving into the budget process, there's a, Morgan and I are going to be working with the building principals to look at data differently. This is, I think everybody's kind of holding their breath and saying, how's this going to work when we're looking at budgeting? And we now have this merged district. And I think that we're, we're not ready to bring it here yet, but it, it's coming where we're going to be able to look at uh, staffing levels. We're going to be able to look at number of students. We're going to be able to look at how we're we're utilizing the human resources that we have, and we're going to be able to do it like at the per pupil level. So that's the the kind of data look we're doing that we're hopeful is going to help guide some conversations around budgeting and planning for the future. So more to come on that, and that's all I have. Okay. So let's go, Kelly. You're up. Um, I have nothing under personnel or student, mostly that I have from the information. Uh, so I just want to talk about a couple of things under school systems and structures. Uh, that has just really been our focus at the start of the school year. So now that there's one administrator in the building, there's some roles and responsibilities of people that have been relinquished. And so it's been a little bit of um, trying to navigate that and um, really looking at the systems level. Um, one of the things that we've been really focused on is supports for students, uh, looking at our EST process, our educational support team process for, for students. Um, Beth and I both share the high school and the elementary school share a behavior specialist and so that has been beneficial in um, even using some of the, the same processes at the high school and at the grade school level. So we've taken some of the work that has been done at the high school level around the EST process and student solving process. And that has really been a focus of a lot of our work. Really having conversations at um, also at the, the universal level about how are we approaching all students you know in the classroom not just students who were identifying as having some situations that we might need to really problem solve mm -hmm. but how are we just really approaching all the instruction with all students around behavior and, and so forth mm -hmm. so that's kind of our, our focus for the beginning of the school year um, under events our after school programs and soccer have started we have about 89 students that have signed up for after school programs. We have 15 different programs that are running. Um, you know, everything from STEM to cooking to Spanish, um, Taekwondo, so a number of students that are participating. Our PTO is planning the annual Halloween event, but they are changing things up this year. I guess it's quite the to do. So, um, no haunted forest this year. Instead, they're doing a, uh, games and dance inside, but it's still the trunk or treat. Right. Yeah. Um, junk and junk then under, under other, um, our continuous, I'm just going to talk very briefly about our continuous improvement plan. Much like you've seen other people present, this is just sort of the overview as opposed to all of the detail of, of what it looks like. Um, Richard has the, the same components, academic proficiency, personalization, health, uh, safe and healthy schools, high quality staffing, and investment priorities. And I think the common thread through all of it is really an MTSS lens, so the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, really looking at what are all of the, those levels of supports for students, so instruction at the universal level, and then just targeted and intensive instruction um, and intervention, how we're, we're engaging families and students. So our work, some of our work at the supervisory union level around engagement for students, student-centered learning, and then we're really focusing our professional development on those, those particular things to really bring it all back. 
Um, and again, with a real emphasis on trying to really focus on safe and healthy schools. Focuses um, have class size data. So our have um, group students together in K to two, and then three to five. Our schools average in those clusters is about fourteen. So we have two uh, grades for or two classes for every grade, pre K to five, except for grade three. We only have one grade three. And there's twenty students currently in that grade three. So it's kind of right on that. Mm -hmm. on that, that level. It's it's gone up and down. We've had it's going to be two this year in there. Um, and so other classes, you know, range from 10 students up to 16 students. Mm -hmm. And so the 20 and that many classes, we just have to look at that's going to look over the mm -hmm. uh, And then in, in all of those, you know, whole class instruction and then um, instructional level groupings, depending on, you know, both within the math and the reading. And then for you know, unified arts and for science and social studies, it's all instruction together. Okay, we have questions about that? No, I don't think so. And then the last thing was our SBAC data, but um, I put that on the agenda, and then you know, that Beth actually presented SBAC data on the elementary school when she presented on the high school in August. So. Okay, great. Thank you. And where's my agenda? Next is Beth. So mine is mostly informational, and I'm not going to read it to you, yeah. but you can let me know if you have any questions. But there's one action item. Yeah. Um, we currently uh, do not have a certified health teacher, mm -hmm. except for me, in the building. And um, so... Right now, we only had a few seniors who needed it because we have had somebody certified. Um, and Emma Hardy is a master. She has a, her MSN, so she's got a master's degree, in, and it was in health education and um, nursing education. So she is willing to become certified. We had a great class that was very popular that Jay Farnham, the PE teacher, and Emma co-taught. Um, uh, but... She thinks the easiest route would be to go through um, peer review, mm -hmm. and she's willing to do that, but she was asking if she could use her tuition reimbursement money toward that process, which could be pricey. And since we're asking her to do it, I would advocate for her using that money. So this comes to the board because our policy doesn't allow us to use um, tuition, or our master agreement doesn't allow tuition reimbursement to be used that way, I understand the argument that that she has made, and I think it makes sense. But we would like that to be a side letter between the union and the board that allows her that, because what I would not want to do is to open up an avenue where anybody who's going for any certification would use that money to go for um, to go towards that. But in this case, we're asking her to do it, and it would benefit the school district. Typically, people pay for their own. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to reduce myself with this. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 So talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> well, it makes sense to me. Um, yeah. I mean, if she had to go and take classes, she'd be taking So we will draft a side letter, and um, are you good with just having Holly's, Holly, gosh, Holly sign it away from the table? Can I sign it? Yeah. Well, you could delegate, and you I could say you want your vice chair to do it. Vice chair, Kevin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What else you got? 
there's some dates, um, homecomings uh, this Friday, freshman reception, which is popular in this community, is Saturday. There's other dates there as well. Um, and then Enosburg and Richburg participated in um, this youth project. Really, uh, our, our um, role was to give the survey and to collect the data. But I, there'll be more about that. I think there were... It's what Heather Moore talked eight, with you yeah, about. Yeah, Heather Moore talked about it. Eight weeks or something, we'll have the data. And they also want us to participate in the mental health first aid. So they want to... NCSS wants to train 140 students in 11th and 12th grade between our two schools. So that was just some informational things. And then my class size report is attached. Um, I, I was finding this a lot more difficult to do this at the high school level than I did at the elementary level. Um, so what I tried to do was to uh, break down the number of students per class and then the average per class, like if there are more than multiple sessions, and then the average for the teacher. And then um, I tried to give you a little um, explanation on the side if I thought they were low or high. For example, um, um, Brianna Morse has some small classes, but the applied math and pre-algebra classes are classes that contain mostly students on IEPs and um, or a 504 EST, so the class sizes are smaller than to give individualized attention than like a straight algebra class. Um, Liz Erickson and Doug McDonald have some small classes and those classes are higher level um, classes either that they're teaching for um, concurrent credit with high school and uh, like VTC or CCB or AP courses. And I do think that our pre-calculus class is smaller this year because we're piloting the EMC squared class uh, that we're one of like four high schools in the state of Vermont mm -hmm. um, that's piloting that course sponsored through VSAC Gear Up. Um, our Spanish and French three and four um, are small, but the second part of the year, uh, the students in that class are gonna be teaching the class with the teacher, they'll be co-teachers, and teaching it to our middle school um, students for an exploratory English class. So we, if, if the classes are small, we try to do something creative like that. So the classes really wouldn't be under the allowable class size when you look at all of the students being considered. So I don't know if you have any questions, but. Yeah. Spanish is. That's right here. Oh, it says it over here. Let's be. Oh, yeah, that says French. Garvey's at the top of page two. Oh, it's up there. There it is. So, where's the Spanish? Okay, next is. Michelle, and I'm way a lot less more complicated than that. <laughs> um, it's complicated. Yes, it is. I just don't want to do that at the high school level ever. Um, but I, I put in some events that are happening as we just for information items in there. And I wish I could tell you right now for item number four which classrooms are all of them that are doing the Rise Vermont um, have signed those agreements. But I can't recall. I know Rob Toys, Lagus, and I believe Carpenters, Tracy's, but I think there may be one or two other ones, and I don't want to, you know, I feel badly, I don't want to leave anyone out. But um, if, you, if you want any more information about that, too, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call at any point, too. But it's good to see that healthy wellness stuff happening around the, the building. Um, my only discussion item was the class size report as well, and it's way less complicated in my little two a couple sentences there. Um, across the board, I'd love to see this flipped over so that we had smaller numbers in our upper with our lower grades than we do in the upper grades, but that's not the case on average. Um, we do our smallest class is our fifth grade. We still have two classroom teachers there, and there's 23 students, but 
all the way down through, it doesn't, we couldn't really cut a teacher because it didn't make sense for every other grade level there. Um, but um, they certainly are on the top end for average in the low, in the lower grades, and I think it's spot on at 15 students for the other, for grade three through five. Any questions about it? Good. Okay. And you heard about the bees a little bit, <laughs> just so you if you hear it in the community. We're trying to figure this out. Had an exterminator there once, and there's someone coming back again tomorrow. But we're just not sure how they're getting in, and or how they're getting into that one classroom. We know where they're getting in outside, and we've made the mm -hmm. corrections out there, but we just aren't able to figure out how they're getting in through the ceiling tiles and stuff. But. We'll get there. Yeah. And I've never hoped for 20 degrees or less. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> Ever. I have now I do. Like <laughs> for, I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Is it scary? Wasn't it scary? Cluster flies. Was it cluster flies? Oh, Will they take the bus? Oh, like that. Um, oh, oh, Michelle, I'm good. You're good? Okay. Um, Rachel. Um, so I kept it really brief this month, just class size report. I did notice a typo for all others in sixth grade. Those should all say 20. Our sixth grade is our biggest class. We are right at the maximum of the age cluster for that, um, for that class size. Um, so we have 40 kids. Um, similar to Michelle, we have a, we have a small eighth grade with 25, but because our, um, seventh and sixth are big, we um, aren't in a position to reduce a staff member and combine those into one. So um, you'll see that one is slight, uh, eighth grade is slightly below. And um, I always like to include at the bottom some data about students who move in and out because we have a lot of um, movement between schools in Franklin County. So um, just at the start of the school year, we had five in or out. Um, and so that's a, I mean, that's a, over 5% of our student population um, moving, and most of them move between um, other Franklin County schools, either, whether it's within district or um, the St. Albans or Maple Run district area. So um, we just have a lot of students who kind of shuffle every couple of years, they kind of shuffle between the same few schools, and I think it's important to track that. We keep track of specifics and um, on a chart just for ourselves, but there's quite a lot of movement um, every year for many students. That's what I got for you. Okay. Just trying to be efficient. Uh, my report is also mostly informational, though I, I am going to need some attention for a few things. But um, in terms of the recent community events, we had a wonderful homecoming a couple weeks ago with a, a great prep spirit week. and. Uh, a week ago last week, and we had our freshman reception, which had a great turnout. Um, and from donated baked goods and uh, ticket intake, we made the ninth grade pulled in just under a thousand dollars, which was pretty nice. Yeah. Um, you have the master schedule attached and the athletic eligibility form. And, uh, and I'm passing down for your review the our continuous improvement plan. Just uh, informing everyone that on October 23rd, uh, there will be five students and eight adults attending uh, the roll-in conference on equity, mm -hmm. and that's held at UVM. And we're pretty excited. We have an eclectic group of kids going, and it's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, people are real excited about it. What I like about it is it comes on the heels of the Vermont Principals Association annual conference that we had last summer in Stowe, which was focused on equity. So it's a continuation of that theme. And uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, as Beth said, that we conducted on Monday the uh, Vermont Youth Project Survey. And again, uh, a lot of it is about preventative stuff and getting an accurate read on how we can um, build capacity uh, district-wide and 
address issues like substance abuse and prevention and that kind of stuff. So um, we had a good turnout for that. Only two students out of uh, our 330 total students that we have as of today uh, refused to take it. One a parent called and said, I don't want my child taking it. And another student who was 18 said, I don't want to take it. So, but I think those are pretty good numbers. All right. Um, we're having our reassessment flex day on November 1st, and um, we've got all the plans in place for that. The scheduling and all has been done. I don't have CBAC scores tonight, but I can get those and I can present on those next week, next month. Um, all but two people have done the com uh, complete, uh, staff have done the recertification for Alice, which is good, and uh, the other two are working on it as we speak, and they have a deadline for it. So want to have a hundred percent accountability there and um, we're on target with our um, fire and evacuation um, efforts at the school and uh, that's another area where Doug works very closely with our SRO and uh, Rachel and me on that. Okay. The last area is personnel. Um, you have Nikki Cribbs um, mm -hmm. her letter and um, there's a, a need right now for two paraprofessionals. Um, I think we may have gotten that down to actually one. We did some creative work today in looking at capacity. Um, and then I would like um, to engage in a conversation around uh, support staff at reception desk level um, in combination with what we've been doing. Um, my assistant, uh, the assistant to the principal. Not my assistant principal. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. this conversation is going to go into personnel. So, it, it is a conversation that it qualifies under executive. executive. Uh, and then, um, I just, before we do that, though, I got one question on the athletic, the athletic eligibility form. Right. Okay. So, say somebody doesn't get all, so say somebody is at 75 mm -hmm. right, or 70 or whatever. Is there a period of time before they can resubmit their paper? Um, if they're ineligible during a quarter, any given quarter, they can resubmit for the following quarter. So okay, so it's a quarter. It's just a quarter, yeah. Okay, and then um, is it the beginning of the quarter they they do that, or I'm assuming the beginning. Of the yeah. Well, there's a whole reassessment as as the quarter comes to an end. The appropriate staff, like Brig and I and other people, will meet with the student who became ineligible, and working to support them throughout the quarter so they can get to eligibility status. Okay, but if they're ineligible for one quarter, are they're ineligible for a whole quarter? Is what for the whole quarter? Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay, so do I have a motion to go to the executive? All in favor? Do it after. So, did we do, why don't we do, do yeah, sorry, move back out. We'll just do Nate, and then we'll do Joseph. If you oh, yeah, lunch, that's a good idea. Nate? Yeah. I was just thinking the rest of us could leave. I don't know. <laughs> If the answer is no, I do not have a lot. You can leave. Uh, okay. I, do not have a lot. <laughs> I don't really want to know what you're okay. going to do. Okay. So, Nate, what do you got? Um, just a couple, just um, the. I don't need to update you on the bus because there's literally no movement there. Okay. Um, the biggest one is uh, a date. Uh, the 22nd is our advisory board, and we're having dinner at 5:30 at Cold Hollow, and I'd love to see any of you guys could attend. So it's the 22nd. It's um, 5:30 is lasagna and salad and yeah. some um, some drinks. Um, and then each program will have their advisory board, not not adult drinks, um, <laughs> iced tea and milk and water. And then if you want to just uh, tour around and check out the advisory board of, of those, you, uh, you're more welcome. And then other than that, the, the class size report um, is attached. We, we are down some numbers where uh, the junior class is one of the smaller ones. Um, and the, one of the trends that we're uh, we're looking at, but not overly worried about, is um, going from junior year to senior year. Uh, those numbers tend to be our getting increase of kids not coming back. 
it's a variety of reasons. Um, usually it's, it's been around seven or eight and now it's been up to 11 and 14. Um, some are early graduation. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are disciplinary and attendance. Uh, last year was the worst attendance year we've ever had with kids at 30 and 40 days of missing school and all of our efforts failing. So they weren't eligible to come back as, as in that second year. So um, so that's a little bit um, worrisome. We're gonna keep an, um, an eye on it, but um, some of the uh, junior, uh, Richard's junior class is one of the smallest. It's very um, small. And that's small so, all the way through. Um, but uh, there's some bigger. So, and we're doing a lot of outreach to eighth graders, ninth graders, and tenth graders. So hopefully, um, CTE and career and tech ed will be a viable option for, for our students. So, I don't know if you have any questions on that. You have a question. So, one of the things that we have we talked about was you started a new program at Cold Hollow three years ago. Diversified right? Ag. So, we have no students in the junior class enrolled in diversified ag. You have six kids in, in the, the senior, senior class. class. Correct. So one of the things the board, which none of you were on the board at that time, the board said that they would re give it a try for three years and then reevaluate whether or not that that was a, a program that um, you, we could sustain okay. over time. So I just wanted to be transparent that that had Right. had been part of the conversation when they began a seventh program at Cold Hollow. So what's the, what's the plan? Well, right now she does ag science. Right. So that's 11 students, and quite a few of those students want to pursue. And right now I've just kind of repositioned her to do outreach. So she's going to, she's starting with Bakersfield next week. She's going to be working doing units during that time in the morning when she's free for outreach. She's going to Enosburg slightly after and Richford, I'm not sure, and then Sheldon, I'm not sure. Career-based. Oh, the LM, you mean right. the middle school? Yeah. 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 We talked about that, okay. okay. Yeah. So I don't know what the numbers will look like for diversified next year. But there's zero but if there's years. zero, but you said they still, she still does um, egg sign. Right. Okay. All right. Okay, any other questions? Wait, there's a lot of kids in the egg science? Correct. Which is an every other day block. One period. Last year there was it's 20 and it was um, two periods. I mean, one of the other, you guys have a diversified ag program too, so that could be taken away from diversified a little bit. Let me know. You have like an ag science class. We, right? This year we've offered it for the first time. Yeah. The, uh, but I don't, know if that takes, I don't know if that's taken away from any kids taking diversified. But. Of the 11, how many are seniors? Not in the ninth and tenth grade class. Okay. So they would be eligible for diversified ag. So part of our conversation was about when, when we're doing enrollment for kids coming to Cold Hollow next year. Right. The conversation at that time about how many kids are going to be interested. If you have no kids from your junior program that would be feeding into the senior part, the second right. year program, how many kids would be enrolled for junior, and when would the board get some of those numbers? Uh, probably by February when we do enrollment. So if she's not going to be, if there's not enough kids for ag science, she could be doing pre-tech, which would be a Perkins funded position or innovation grant funded position because we don't have any pre-tech. We're the only tech center that doesn't have a pre-tech teacher. Mm -hmm. And if you do pre-tech, is that at Cold Hollow or do you push into the high schools? It could, it's usually at Cold Hollow, but it could be up here. She could travel. I mean, she's going to travel anyway because she's going to all the middle schools. So. Right. So this is one of those opportunities where, where we have as a system to look more flexibly about what we could do with staffing structure. And that's one of the things that sure. Nate's been really good at is this year we've identified that, you know, she typically would have an assigned class, but there were no students enrolled there. So looking at this as an opportunity to push out and right. do some of that recruitment work in the middle schools and get them to take a look at what are some of the offer offerings at Cold Hollow. Uh, so I think that that's, that's the good part of this flexibility of us being able to do some of that now. Okay. Anything else? That's it. All right. So we're going to move into executive session. I believe you all and did you want to give us the aspects oh, yeah. you're going to hand out? Do you want me to stay for the... Yeah, if you want to. It's up to you. Would you like me to stay for... Sure. I'm just going to pass this around. I'll send three that 
that way. These are just new board member contacts. Um, and then we, we don't need to have a deep conversation about SBAC um, tonight, and if you want to, um, or we can have it at the SU meeting. So I'm giving you information that's specific to Enosburg and Richford. So it's reporting out uh, comparison data from the state, our supervisory union, and then the school. So when you see green on there, the green um, is indicates that our performance is higher than the state average. The red would indicate lower than the state average. There's also a change column for you to tune into. So the, the change column reflects comparison data. So that would not be cohort. It wouldn't be comparing students against themselves. It would be comparing, for example, how did Enosburg's third grade do last year compared to this year's third grade group? So you can see that change data is plus one. So it was 1% higher for Enosburg Elementary in that top column here. So again, that's not comparing students against students. That's grade level against grade level. Okay. So this is for you to digest, think about, talk about, mm -hmm. ask questions. Yeah. So one of my pet peeves on this, as I said last night, is there are no statistics on these things. Absolutely no statistics on these things. So is a plus one change to me. Or plus twenty three percent, twenty seven percent change up significantly. Or minus twenty three percent. I think that's it. I think plus twenty seven significant. I would I bet you it is. I bet you it is. <laughs> so so then it's twenty three percent down to me. Yeah, that's gonna be it. Yeah. See I think that's just that's just that's just noise in the in the in the test data. Because we have so few students. There is no, there is no statistics around these to make decisions. Right. So you're looking more for, if you're looking for statistical relevance, you're wanting us to bring you, I'm guessing here, like three years worth of comparison data, because that's generally when you have an end the size of ours. Right. You're looking for change over a multi-year, three-year period in order to get some relevant data. Right. I, so I, I, so you don't want to be making. Decisions based on this data because it's just random chance. Right? I which think can, it's which happens. It's more time. than random chance. I think there there's some validity to anything less than eighty seven students is you're gonna have data that's skewed just by one or two kids. Mm -hmm. However, um, with smaller numbers you can also do a lot of really intentional instructional things that can hopefully move the needle. I'm proud of our scores. I think they represent the work we put in to help students really build skills. We put in an intervention block last year, um, and we did see change between the previous school years. And um, so I think there, I, I think Lynn makes a good point. Looking at the same cohort over several years is a really good way to see that when you have smaller numbers. Um, this is but, one data point, though. Yep. I would never encourage you to make programmatic changes with one data point. Yep. There are lots of other data points that we could be looking at as well. And I, I think you got, you took a look at some data points last night on the snapshot that we can talk about. Where I'm certainly not ready yet to talk about that because I want to get in there and look at um, if it's representative of, of actual data. And I haven't done that yet. Um, but there are other levels of data, and I think that the principles definitely look at this data at the school level much differently than we represent it at your level in terms of change over time. Because yeah. the other piece of this is looking at, you know, what was this child's score last year compared to this year? Like, are we able to demonstrate that they've made a year's or more growth yeah. for a year's worth of instruction? Like, that's the level that we're getting at is at that student level. So this is us trying to bring that level of information to you isn't as easy as being able to do this. We could do it. We could summarize that type of information in terms of like scale score progress. That's certainly available. Well, we there, have I sent you some information and sent, I believe I sent it. Did I send it to board members? The link to the Digger article. I don't remember now if I sent it to board members where they took a look at um, of, like of, this is another way to break it down, of the students in each school who were proficient looking at what that average skill score was in this year um, 
So that was just an interesting, because even though you might have had like 80% of your kids proficient, the average of their scare, scale score was much lower than some of the other schools that had fewer kids who were proficient. So there's another way to look at the data. There's, there's You can disaggregate this data in, in a ton of different so, ways. And I so. think that you would also need to look at some other things like... I know there's a direct correlation between the number of years, your veter the how veteran your staff is in your SBAC scores. Yep. So if you have every teacher in school that's new and teaching at Richmond Elementary School, they're all first, second year teachers. And that that impacts your SBAC scores. You've got to be able to um, keep teachers to develop they're learning everything in their first two or three years as being a teacher. I think there's also a correlation. There's there's several things you you would need to look at. Um, I think continuity of leadership is another. Yeah, continuity of leadership. Um, um, factor in terms of improvement over time. Oh, I've yes. shared over the years how move different ins, yep. our mm -hmm. and move out. when we have students that are career kiddos, and then those. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't. I can't tell you how frustrating it is, it is. to just be like, what? Yeah, if you look at it the transients, your whole class averages. So percentage of students on plans, special um, IEPs, 504s. Yeah. And that's um, often, all of this is often not data we can report out because if you have less than 10 kids, you yeah. can't share any of it because you could identify the students based on the numbers. Right. So you have to... Even if we were to say, like, look at this great growth in this, these yeah. nine kids that moved in, we wouldn't be able to share that right. with you. That's and, only uh, only available at the school level. And there there is a chart like this for the NMV side that actually has, like, Xs because the numbers are too small. We can't legally even share it with board yeah. members. Yeah. Yeah. Grade levels yeah. that have right. less than... Right. Like the so fifth grade class two years ago compared to the fifth grade class last year with the SBAC data in Richford, there's o over 50% of the kids on la in the last year's fifth grade were on IEPs. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to. So I think one of the interesting things to look at in that regard is the growth of the individual student. Exactly. Right. So even if the child remains below grade level, have has has you know the gap at least stayed like this or has it narrowed a little bit as opposed to widening so thinking about the growth of the individual student even if they remain yeah, below grade level there's a student who you know you might have a student who started out at a really low one like mm -hmm. pretty far from what the target was but they may have made like the equivalent of I don't know, 300 scale score yeah. point gain. Right. Like that, that's a huge mm -hmm. win for that individual student, but it doesn't show. This it doesn't the show in this data. Reports out on the data, yeah. that doesn't show mm -hmm. out. Right. That doesn't show for that individual child. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a, there's another child who's not meeting proficiency. We've asked the state if they have any plans to ever report just the number of students who have made at least mm -hmm. a year's growth. Because when we break that down at the school level, it's usually. 80, per, 80 to 95 yeah. percent showing that level of growth per grade level. It's just that that's not how they report the data. They don't say every kid is making progress from where they are. They say, here's a tar arbitrary target this group of people has set who made this test, and here's the number of your kids who have met But they're it. not even reporting like this anymore. No, they're not. They're, they're, that's how they're starting to report with the right. dashboard yeah, on the little are the thing. kids making growth, right. not on the number of kids proficient. But they're but not the, quite there yet. Right. They're There's getting much, there. They're working they're, toward They're working toward, I don't know how much they shared with you guys last night, but the that formula that for calculating out that growth is... So. incredibly complex very like complex. we sat through all of our administrators sat through a snapshot training this summer and at the end of the training I thought oh my gosh if someone asked me to describe mm -hmm. how we were able to calculate that growth index I, I there's no way I could describe how they're doing it it is and, and we I even I think I asked at that meeting I don't know if you guys remember but I was like mm -hmm. okay how would I describe this in an elevator speech? Like something that was understandable mm -hmm. to people. And, and that was like the best they could do at that time in terms of the elevator speech because they were having a hard time making it a concise, understandable. Yeah. Yep. So, so I'm in agree with, agreement with you in, in that 
well, and, and Lynn too, like this is one data point, but you're right, there are so many things to think about if you're going to think about program changes. So, yeah. And just that growth piece for kids is so critical, and I think that like that's a really important piece for the for the board to understand when we're you know communicating um, any kind of data or or you know results to to families and community members is that we need to also really be thinking about the growth of the kids individually. Okay, thank you. So good night, and we are moving into executive session at seven fifteen. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? How are you also not in your consent agenda? Oh. Just remember that. Oh, yes. I'm gonna do that after. Um, thank you.